Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of The Build Room where we're continuing to work on our 1976 RA23 Toyota Celica, aka Violet Crumbles. So in today's episode, I'm going to spend the first five minutes lying to you profusely and then I'm going to show you the importance of having the right tools and in cavemen, inventing fire. So let's get into it. Okay, so first things first for this week, we cleaned the garage. I moved my other project car back right against the back wall and moved my workbench in the front, which is great. And then generally speaking, just tidied everything up. I moved the blasting cabinet further back because the door actually opened into my toolbox, which meant I had to pull it way out in order to use it. So. That's in a good spot there. I can just roll that drum out of the way and get whatever I want in there. And yeah, just tidy it up so I have a bit more room. Uh, before I had only sort of a meter and a half of free area here between the front of the car and the nose of the other project. So now we have so much room for activities. And those activities this week are going to be getting all of this suspension stuff onto the RA23. So let's check out what we've got. Okay, so we have an absolute shirtload of parts here and I'll just run through them quickly so you can see what we're gonna do. And there are still more parts coming. So we have uh, front and rear king springs. These are KTRL 11s and KTFL 14s, which are rear and front lowered springs for the RA23. They should get us about 30 millimeters lower than stock. And bear in mind that the suspension you've seen on the car thus far is raised. I'm not sure how, and that'll be part of the um, surprise as we pull it apart. But yeah, that's definitely higher than stock at the moment. So I would say we're probably going to be about two inches to maybe two and a half inches or 60 millimeters lower than that when we swap these bad boys in. Along with that, we also have a full front and rear set of Super Pro urethane bushes. There's a lot of different brands of these on the market. I don't know whether these are better or worse than anything else, but I know that these will be better than the junk rubber that is in there from, well, I don't know if it's been replaced since the car was first put together in the factory. I would hope so, being it's 50 years old now or nearly 50 years old, but we will see. I have a front sway bar. This is a ratty secondhand front sway bar, but unfortunately front sway bars for an RA23 are really quite hard to get now. This is a white line 24 mil unit. It's also a four point blade adjustable item as well, which basically means you can move the uh, mounting points here to stiffen or loosen the actual, the tension that is on that sway bar so that it'll um, flatten out the front more or less. We also have some ball joints, some left and right tie rod ends. We have a pitman arm, which connects to the steering box. And we have an idler arm. Now, all of those are for an RA23. This is for an RA40. The reason being is you cannot, for love nor money, can you get an RA23 idler arm anymore. Now, this is gonna be an interesting part of um, the episode in terms of, from what I've read online, I haven't ever replaced an idler arm on an RA23 before, but from what I've read online, the RA40 and the RA23 are different but they're similar enough in the length of the arm that you can take the mounting bracket off the RA40 and swap it with the mounting bracket for the RA23 and then they will substitute. But I've also heard contradicting stories that the actual length from the center line of the rotating point on the bracket's pivot to the center line on the ball joint is actually different by about half an inch. And a friend of mine actually had his idler arm after he did this conversion snap just before the end of the joint. So it could be that he was given a wrong part or it could be that they are actually different in length and a lot of people have been getting away with it for longer than they should and there is actually a risk here. So, you know, with steering geometry and the stability and safety of the steering system, it's not something anyone should be playing games with. So. We're gonna have a look at that today and hopefully either prove or disprove the theory. So the first thing we've got to do is jack the car up in the air and uh, get some access to everything. So might as well do that now.
Okay, so looking under the car, um, the first thing I notice here is, if you remember from the first episode when I was talking about this uh, splash shield or whatever you want to call it, um, I did mention that it looked like it had a hit at some time. If you can see, there's a almost a perfect circle that's been pushed into that. I would hazard a guess to say someone has tried to jack this car up thinking that this was a structural element and not just thin sheet. And yeah, not capable of supporting 1,040 kilos. So that's buckled under, that's all right. I've got to remove that uh, as part of this process that we're about to go through. So I'll tap that back into place, give it a neaten up and um, it'll need to be painted and everything anyway. So first thing that we're going to do here is remove the majority of the steering componentry. Okay, so what we need to do first is basically remove the majority of the steering components. Now, if we look over here, we have this is the driver's side, well, the Australian driver's side strut, the right-hand side of the car, and it has a, a little steering arm here that steering arm connects into a tie rod and there's inner and outer tie rod ends and then the sleeve which is used to adjust those two that tie rod connects into this bar here here which is called the the relay rod or the drag link or center rod there's a few different names for pretty much every part on a car and then back into a tie rod that connects to the other strut so the lateral movement of this bar here is what causes the car to steer. Now, that bar wouldn't just be stable in midair, so it has the idle rod here that I was referring to before, the one that's difficult to get, and you have the pitman arm here, which connects into this big thing, which is the steering box. And the steering box basically connects into the steering column, pushes into the car, and then you turn that wheel. This pitman arm will move like a clock left to right, and that movement will trans transfer through the drag link or the relay rod uh, into turning the wheels left and right. So the main problem with this is, um, I mean, this is a, a fairly old school method of steering. Nowadays, everything has a steering rack, which is a, a different movement. So these, because they have so many joints and things like that, they can get a lot of slop in them. So basically you're turning the wheel in the cabin, but all these tie rod ends, they wear out. The steering box itself can wear and get a lot of movement, especially around the center. And yeah, there's just a lot of play. So we need to make sure that the structural integrity of all these pieces is good because we don't want anything here breaking. That would be fairly catastrophic in terms of losing steering, but also that it's nice and tight. So we'll start just by unbolting the pitman arm We'll unbolt the idler and we will do our best to separate these tie rod ends from the steering knuckles. Now, they can be really hard to remove. The beauty of this is I'm not worried about damaging any of these because we're replacing them all. So I can give them a pretty hefty love tap with the Persuadatron. And then once we've removed all of those steering linkages, we'll actually work on them on the bench. It's just easier than trying to work upside down under a car and end up getting junk in your eyes and all that sort of thing. Having a bench vise is great for all this sort of stuff. So once we've got this steering componentry out, we're then going to move on to the bushes. There are bushes that we're gonna replace on the ends of these bars here, which are the caster rods or track rods. Again, everything has multiple names. so. There's a couple of bushes here and here that need to be replaced. This bar here is the sway bar. So it has bushes here and here that are going to be replaced and bushes here and obviously the same on the other side of the car. We're actually replacing this sway bar with that bigger unit that I showed you. So all of this will come out and re be replaced with new bushes. This connection from the strut down, it connects into a ball joint here, which we're replacing and we'll also replace the bush in this, which is the lower control arm. Okay, so we'll, we'll be taking all of this out, basically strip it down to nothing and then build it back up with new parts. Okay, so I think what's next is I'll set the camera up somewhere so you can see this happen, but I won't walk you through it step by step be easier in a time lapse and we'll just get all of this out so just one quick tip with these um, if you are taking the tie rod end out and you want to save it um, so you can get tie rod end separators that are forks that sort of go in between these two and you belt them in from the side with a big hammer and they apply some pressure down to pop them apart but you normally end up ripping the boot and all sorts of things. It's not great. If they're not lodged in there particularly tight, I don't know if these will be or not. So we're just going to have to try this. But you can sometimes just hit it on the top of here with a hammer and it will be enough to basically um, dead blow out 
uh, that. So that's what we're going to try first up to see if we get this out of this the easy way. Um, but if you are striking the top of this and you want to reuse all of this, um, you are liable to damage all these threads. So the easy way to deal with it is to thread the nut back on and do it up until there's just a little bit proud so that you've got a bigger surface to strike and you're not going to end up damaging these threads, but you still have enough threads on the nut uh, so that it's got a significant amount of purchase. And, and when you're trying to do these things, using a little claw hammer is, is really not going to apply much impact. So uh, you want to get a uh, what, what you call a, a, a lump hammer or a gimpy hammer or a, a baby sledgehammer just to try and knock these down. Okay, so that tie rod end is well and truly stuck. Um, you can literally spend days trying to get those things apart if you don't have the right equipment. Um, I recall pulling one out on a TA-22 when I was uh, a lot younger, and I think we did spend at least a day or two, and in the end we had to make our own special tie rod end separator that was a, uh, a cheap $10 tie rod end separator that was all I could afford with a large piece of metal pipe welded on the end and then belting it with a full-sized sledgehammer from the top of the engine bay and that was the only way we got it off and it was about two days worth of frustration and I never want to do it again. Luckily, I have a reasonable tie rod end separator um, and I'll show you how that works in a second and then the other thing that can help with the removal of a tie rod end is the application of heat so we use the right tools this time you do want to wear eye protection because you you there's a um, going to be a significant amount of kinetic energy stored in this stuff so let's get into it and hopefully i'll have both eyes when we finish this That actually came out really easy. Um, I'd just done the other side and it basically exploded, but that came out a lot better than I was hoping. So that's a little bit of a stretch for the internet. Anyway, that's out. We are loose and good. Okay, so now that we've got that tire down out of the way, we're gonna take off the Pitman arm main bolt. Um, I have to remove the whole lot, so rather than mess around taking these two tie rod ends out, which I can do on the bench as I mentioned before, we're going to undo this nut and then see if we can get any movement here. Now we need to take off the... Um, lower control arm, sway bar, the caster or track rods, and, um, and then we're ready to start bashing some bushes. All right, I think that is everything. All right, so we've removed the suspension from the front of the car. It's time to move on to the rear. This is a live axle rear, it's not independent. So to get the diff out, we're gonna to have to remove the tail shaft, which is just towards the snout of the diff that you can see there. We're gonna to have to remove the lower and upper control arms, the shocks and the pan hard rod. There's also a brake line that we'll have to disconnect in there and then we should be pretty good just to um, drop it down on a jack and uh, get it out from under the car. One thing that I wanna do before I take it out of the car is just try and get the drums off. Uh, they can stick and be quite hard to pull off. So I find the best way to do it is just to 
give the drum here a tap with a hammer just to sort of see if you can help break the seal. I've already done it a bit. You can see the rust that's sort of been coming out the bottom. And then there's two bolt holes here and you basically screw a bolt into both of those and it bottoms out on the hub behind this. And as you bolt them in, it'll just pull it off. Sort of like the, the pitman arm removal tool or the ball joint uh, removal tool that we were using before. The one thing you do want to do, because you've got so much corrosion on this, if you look, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a bit there. There'll be some in the holes as well. So I've already put some WD-40 in them just to soften up. I'm going to give them a little bit of a scrub out and then a little, little bit more WD-40 and then we'll see if we can get a bolt into them. I do have the impact gun there. I'm not going to use that straight off the bat because I don't, I don't want to strip these threads or damage them. We'll try it first just with the normal socket. We also want to make sure that when you do these, you do it a little bit at a time. You don't want to crank up one because you're just going to move the drum off centre and then it's going to bind up. So just a little bit at a time. So we'll see it starting to move. Oop. And that crack means that it's just separated broken the seal and we should be good. Yep, keep cracking. See it moving off the hub. Easy as that. Okay, that was well and truly an exercise in stupidity. Um, basically, shouldn't have used the impact wrench, as I said on the other side of the car. Um, so, what I've actually done here is this deformed and actually cracked, which is fine because I was going to replace the drums anyway, but both holes are threaded. So what I'm going to try and do is just weld a nut onto each of these and try again. That is some really, really ugly welding. That is a how not to weld glass. Okay, we still move the bolts, which is good. And these, of course, are different size. Oh, that sounded good. I'm gonna run out of thread here. This one's working. This one, this stupid mud metal bolt. Um, just sheared off. Now I have a bolt blocking the hole to actually push this out. So I'm gonna to have to revert to the slide hammer, which means welding something onto it, which sucks, but this is where we're at. All right, hopefully that's strong enough. Okay, that one's backed out now, just so that we can make sure we don't have any pressure there. We're just looking to pull this one out. Okay. Woo. That goes part way there. I'm just gonna see if it's loosened up on this side yet. It looks 
like it's quite tight here. I'm just gonna spray some WD-40 in there. It's probably gonna make any difference, but just in case. Just clear off some of the surface corrosion. I'm gonna grind this weld off. Didn't really penetrate, as you can see. Well, it has, it's just pulled the top layer. This is cast. So let's just pull the top layer of the casting out. So I'm gonna give it another go. Hopefully that will be enough to get the last little bit out. We'll back this one off as well. Ah, so close too. Literally almost off. Okay, I freely admit that is ridiculous, um, but we're so close to being able to get this off. Should let that cool down, put the slide hammer on it, and just see if I can just do it really, really softly. Uh, rather than giving it heavy hits, more small hits. Hopefully that will stay tacked on. That nut is still way too hot to hold, but it's all right. probably more things done wrong than done right on this um, yeah if I was just more careful in the first place this probably wouldn't have happened but it's off now I'll, I'll cut that bolt off to retrieve my slide hammer nut um, but other than that it looks like everything's still in good shape yeah we haven't damaged the brakes in any way so I guess, what, after an hour or so of messing around, we can get on to uh, removing the diff. So looking at the rear of the car, um, we've got the, obviously this is the differential. I'm um, going to each of the rear wheels. Uh, this rod here is the, the pan hard rod. Um, it basically stops the lateral movement of the diff on the back end. Um, and then we have upper control arms here and lower control arms here and uh, there's there's two of them so that the diff can move up and down but stay relatively upright um, if you're going to lower your car significantly it's a good idea to get adjustable upper track rods because that'll help you to um, kick this disc this uh, this this diff on the right angle uh, where so we're going to have to remove pan hard rod the shocks uh both of the control arms and also the the handbrake cable um there's one of those to either side and we'll also looking under here we'll have to take off this brake line as well um and then we should be able to pull this diff out and we'll just rest it on we'll just put a uh, a jack under here i'm going to drain the diff first as well so that'll be the first thing um diff oil absolutely stinks 
for anyone who's ever changed the oil in a diff, you'll know exactly what I mean. But yeah, it's it's a horrible, stinky, stinky, stinky substance. I don't know why they don't put something in it to make it smell like strawberries. <laughs> Okay, so we're done. We have finished pulling out pretty much everything from under the car that we need to. Um, I'm very glad to be out from under there. Everybody hates working under cars. If you've done it before, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, a hoist is a godsend in these situations, but I don't have one. Uh, so where are we now? Let's have a look. This is pretty much everything that we've just pulled out of the car. Got the diff up on jack stands. Um, yeah, this is, other than the gearbox and the engine, this is pretty much everything under the car. Um, so now we have the awesome job of cleaning this up as much as possible so that um, we can get on with the next stages. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and use um, a bit of degreaser, but also some hot water through the high pressure cleaner and see if that'll um, break off some of this gunk so I don't have to stand there scrubbing it with a brush all day. Um, so yeah, let's see how we go. dried off now or drying off um, you can see that you know there's not a lot of grease on anything it's all it's all nice and clean there's a lot of still surface rust and, and bits and pieces um, so they're not fully prepped yet but they are in pretty good shape um, I left all of these like the relay rod and the tie rods and things like that all together and there's a reason for that um, we're gonna run out of time in today's episode I think but um, if you are pulling yours apart, I would suggest you leave it together just for now and um, we'll go through why in the next episode. Um, yeah, everything looks pretty reasonable. Um, diff came up okay. Uh, the next stage will be just to um, scrub any surface rust that's left over off these, give them a bit of rust converter and then I'll probably get a can of um, uh, the old Dulux reconditioning. Um, give them a bit of a rattle can spray job so they look good and they're a bit more protective when they go back in the car. Other than that, the sun's going down, so I think before I finish up the episode, I will give you a look at the car. It does look pretty interesting with no undercarriage up on jack, so we'll do that and then I'll tell you what's in store for the next episode. Okay, so this is the car sans any form of suspension or driveline other than the motor and gearbox. Now there is a couple of things that have come up while I've been pulling this apart that are gonna have to be repaired before we can undercoat. So all of this area in here and the rest of the underbody, we're gonna put some uh, deadener, undercoat, underbody sealer, whatever you wanna call it, to cover all this up and seal it so that it doesn't rust at all. Now we already have some rust. If I just put some light over here, you can see at the bottom of that strut tower, there's some rust there and then actually there's some holes there through to daylight on the other side. We also have a problem here where it looks like someone has tried to pull the car sideways with the tow hook and they've actually separated the sheet metal under here. So yeah, there's that's just the passenger side front wheel well. There's also some things underneath the car and in the other wheel wells that I'll show you in the next episode. Basically, I'm pretty happy with where it sits at the moment. It was a massive episode. Uh, we did get a lot done. There was a lot of time lapses that I had to shorten. So yeah, there was a lot of messing around trying to get those troublesome things apart. But hopefully now we have a pretty good base to move forward with. 
Okay, so that brings us to the end of another episode. In next week's episode, I'm going to fix the rust and some of those other panel issues in the wheel wells. Then I'm going to clean the underside of the car, sand it back and get it prepped, and then throw a couple of coats of stone guard or underbody protection or whatever you want to call it on there so that we've got a really clean, fresh base ready for when those suspension components go back in. So in terms of the format of these episodes, I have been struggling to compress everything into that 25 to 30 minute time slot without losing the detail that the people who might want to replicate this work at home need. So I'm thinking the solution here may be to break the episodes up and have two 20 minute episodes with the same amount of detail, but just in a slightly more consumable time frame. Now, either way, if you're liking what you are seeing, it'd be great if you can subscribe and hit that notification bell. That really is going to help the channel grow in these early stages. And if you like the length as it is, maybe give the video a like. And if you don't, leave me a comment below and let me know what you think would work as a better format. It'd be really good to get some feedback from you guys that I can use to shape the channel moving forward. In either case, thanks very much for watching today's episode and I hope I'll see you next week on The Build Room. Bye for now.